Welcome everybody to our keynote speech. Uh, Ron Wasserstein is executive director of the American Statistical Association. A variety of distinguishing things go along with that. Um, he was invited because the American Statistical Association 2016 made this rather important statement, which has affected all, all the world of science, I think, and you know, going on beyond. Uh, how that happened, how that you can get reform done, really is wonderful to learn about. So. Thanks so much, your staff there. Yeah. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. So good afternoon. In the fall of 1991, a, uh, a confluence of weather events took place. Uh, as I understand it, and I don't know a lot about meteorology, but there was a cold front and a and a, high, a ridge of high pressure, and the remnants of a hurricane came along and kind of slid under that. And the result was something that uh, uh, was called the perfect storm, celebrated in, in a book and then uh, followed by uh, a movie. And this was, um, this confluence of events led to um, 13 deaths uh, directly related to the storm, hundreds of millions of dollars of damage. Well, we have a confluence of events going on right now. It's the last talk of the conference. <laughs> on some of your body clocks, on mine, it's already well into the evening, and I'm your speaker. So this has all the ingredients for the perfect nap, all right? <laughs> the, um, if that meets your needs right now, <laughs> go right ahead. I also should add that I'm completely comfortable with you getting up and, and, and getting food during this presentation. Um, I, I'm easier to swallow with food, to be honest, and, uh, but throwing it is, is not acceptable, um, no matter what the quality of the talk is. And speaking of the talk, there's a, another kind of talk that, uh, that you're familiar with um, if you are a parent or if you had parents, um, and that is the, the discussion about uh, human reproduction, the birds and the bees. Now, I have no idea why it's called the birds and the bees, since neither birds nor bees reproduce in the same way that humans do, but it's not up to me to mess with time-honored metaphors like that. About, well, almost six years ago, my wife and I brought home a couple of boys from Haiti. They were 10 years old at the time and spoke no English, and we were, and we certainly had no Haitian Creole to call on. So we're working through all that, and and, you know, two or three months later, I'm down in the basement um, enjoying a Washington Nationals game on TV, a world champion Washington Nationals. I want to be sure to sneak in here. Um, when my wife came down the stairs with the boys and a gleam in her eye and something had gone on upstairs that made her feel like it was time for me to have that discussion with them. Now, I hope I've gone on long enough about this so that you're wondering why I'm mentioning it. And the reason is, is that I've had a great opportunity over the last four or five years to talk to a lot of people, especially non-statistical scientists, about p-values. And what I've discovered is that that conversation is very much like trying to have that conversation with my kids, which was which was fairly complicated because that talk is, hard, is awkward enough to begin with, and then we didn't have, we had language barriers. But let me see if I can convince you that there are some similarities. So other scientists feel like they know all about p-values already because they've heard about it from their peers, and of course, <laughs> kids are kind of that way. It was not nearly as interesting as they thought it was going to be. They, my boys stopped listening long before I stopped talking. And if I'm going to be completely honest with myself, probably they understood it even less after they had that discussion. So d that's just fair warning about how this talk may go. And I don't know your backgrounds, how, how statistical you are or whatever, but it won't be a problem here. At least I'm pretty sure. I have a highly valid and reliable one item test for you to see whether you'll be able to follow this conversation. If you can pass this test, you're good to go. So if this is understandable, then this is about the technical level that you, you need to follow the rest of, of what's going on. All right, so I guess nobody left, everybody's good to go. 
Let me start off by saying what the 2016 ASA statement on p-values and statistical significance contained. Um, and then we'll talk about how we got there, which is the, the thrust of this presentation. So it was a document that was created by a panel of experts. More to say about that in a bit. It was endorsed by the board of directors of the ASA, and it contains an introduction, a definition of a p-value. The heart of the document is six principles, which I'll elaborate on very briefly in a moment. It talks about some uh, other approaches that can be used and then has a conclusion and a really nice set of references if you want to delve deeper. So we felt like if we were going to have a statement on p-values, we ought to have a, a definition, and we were going for an informal one. And so this is what we put together. Informally, a p-value is the probability under a specified statistical model that some statistical summary of the data, maybe, for example, uh, uh, comparing uh, two uh, sample means, would be equal to or more extreme than its observed value. And we felt like that was pretty straightforward. But the press disagreed. They said that uh, that was about as clear as mud. All right? You decide uh, that for yourself. Maybe you like this definition better. Someone <laughs> suggested that as an alternative. And if, 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 you're, if you're good with this, good on you. So what did the um, uh, 2016 statement do? Well, it articulated uh, six principles. P-values can indicate how incompatible the data are with a specified statistical model. P-values do not measure the probability that the studied hypothesis is true or the probability that the data were produced by random chance alone. Scientific conclusions and business or policy decisions should not be based only on whether a p-value passes a specific threshold. Proper inference requires full reporting and transparency. A p-value or statistical significance does not measure the size of an effect or the importance of a result. And by itself, a p-value does not provide a good measure of evidence regarding a model or hypothesis. I would say from my standpoint as having been uh, involved in this uh, uh, process deeply, as were some other people in this room, and I'll highlight that momentarily, that the biggest takeaway from the ASA statement is that bright line thinking has been bad for science. And, and here's, a, um, here's a specific uh, quote to that effect uh, from Ken Rothman in one of the supplemental articles to the uh, 2016 ASA statement. Scientists have embraced and even avidly pursued meaningless differences solely because they are statistically significant, and have ignored important effects because they have failed to pass the screen of statistical significance. So he says, it's a safe bet that people have suffered or died because scientists and editors, regulators, journalists, and others have used significance tests to interpret results and have consequently failed to identify the most beneficial courses of action. So that's pretty serious, but why did we get into the... Um, why did we decide in 2016, well, actually, in 2014, as you'll see in a moment, to work on an ASA statement? Well, I could illustrate that with a lot of quotes, but I'll just do one. Um, I'll reveal who said this in a moment and when. It's been widely felt, probably for 30 years and more, that significance tests are overemphasized and often misused, and that more emphasis should be put on estimation and prediction. Well, that was said by David Cox, Sir David Cox, um, brilliant statistician, winner of the International Prize in Statistics. And he said that in 1986. And he says that that has been going on for at least 30 years. So in full disclosure, that goes 1986, go back 30 years, goes back to the year of my birth. So for my entire lifetime and longer, this has uh, been identified as uh, a problematic area. And there's much more um, information about this at this website, and, and these slides will be made available. So that's why in the uh, introduction to the ASA statement, Nicole and I said that we weren't writing about anything new, that, that statisticians and others had been sounding the alarm about these matters uh, for decades to little avail. So that begs the question, if this has been going on for so very long, why did we decide to do something about it when we did? Well, there began to be a lot of um, things in the popular press about the issues associated with p-values and statistical significance. For example, 
Um, this sci uh, uh, Scientific American article in 2010, odds are it's wrong, and you can't read the subtitle there, but it says uh, science, um, science fails to recognize the shortcomings of statistics. So basically it throws my whole discipline under the bus because people have difficulties dealing with some issues related to p-values and statistical significance. And there were lots of other articles like this one in, in phys.org. But going back to the Siegfried article in, in Scientific American, he described statistics as a mutant form of math, okay? which is slightly objectionable to the executive director of the American Statistical Association. So that sort of thing uh, lit a fire under us, but it, it, was, uh, it, take, it took some doing because, and, and this is a, really a, a, a critical point for the discussion that, that David invited me to bring to you today, and that is that this was way outside our lane. This was not the sort of thing that we got into before. Yep, we did have some position statements, but they, would, they tended to be about very specific matters of practice. So, for example, risk-limiting audits uh, is, is a, uh, a, a methodology for evaluating the, um, whether you need a recount on a, on a ballot or not. Um, we had a statement about um, how you should, things you should watch out for when you use value-added models in education, for example, and so on. Um, that's not what we're talking about here. We're talking about something that's at the core of statistical practice. And so it, it, it took some doing for us to, to get comfortable in, in stepping in here. But we did it because it, it matters. And, and, um, and so here's a quote from Steve Goodman. Uh, this is from the, uh, a special issue of the American Statistician that I'll say more about in a little bit. For the first time since standard frequentist methods were introduced in the 1920s, science as a discipline is acknowledging the harms done by their misuse and looking for alternatives. Science is too important to society to neglect our responsibility to make it as reliable as possible. For those who do research involving or that, that could ultimately affect humans, it is a moral imperative, says Dr. Goodman. So, okay, so here's the, the heart of what's going on here, and that is what was the process that we used to, to do this, to do something that was hard for us to do, that was, was quite unnatural, really. So it began um, all the way back uh, almost uh, six years ago when I asked the board for permission to launch this project. Um, I didn't come up with the idea. I was stimulated by one of our members, George Cobb, who, who, who wrote an email to one of, our, one of our discussion groups sort of challenging why it is that we weren't thinking more about this from the societal standpoint. So I asked the board for permission to develop a panel of experts to consider an ASA statement, and that summer I went to work recruiting that panel looking for experts with a wide variety of viewpoints because I know it'll shock you, having sat around and listened to talks for the past, you know, day and a half, there are a wide variety of viewpoints. <laughs> so how did, I, how did I go about doing that? Well, I, um, I wrote an invitation letter to uh, invite people to participate. And uh, I, this is uh, from that letter. I indicated that the board had asked staff to consult with some people about whether we should be doing this, whether we should issue a statement. The primary audience would be the broader scientific community, but, of course, it impacts statisticians as well. And the board's consideration is in response to a recommendation from an ASA member, and I gave a link to some articles and then went on to say that if you think an ASA statement on the use or meaning of p-values is a good idea, would you be willing to participate in an ad hoc committee to draft such a statement? And who else would you recommend? And if you don't think an ASA statement on this topic would be helpful, um, but others do, would you be? Uh, we'd, we'd like to consult with you, even if you don't want to participate directly. Well, to my great delight, virtually everyone that we reached out to said they would be happy to participate or that they didn't want to be left out if we were going to do it, whether they'd be happy to participate or not. Um, this 
individual wrote, I think it is well past time for a group like the ASA to make a statement about p-values. It may seem obvious or unnecessary to statisticians, but lack of clarity in this area has created tremendous confusion, if not wrong conclusions, in the applied uh, sciences since uh, almost since the 30s. He says, honestly, I felt a bit of, quite a bit of confusion among statisticians as well. I have a talk where I review the p-value definitions and interpretations in a bunch of biostat textbooks, and quite a few don't get it right. Now, not everyone. Um, I said virtually everyone, but not everyone. I don't think a statement specifically on p-values would be very helpful. The problem addressed by the Nature piece, one of the links that I sent, for example, goes way beyond p-values and into the general problem of reproducibility. Here we are today. The latter is really where the problem lies, and p-values are one component of that. That's just my opinion. So here are the members of the p-value panel. Um, for those of you who are connected to the statistical community, you'll see that we have some real heavyweights there, um, some people who have uh, done a lot of writing and thinking uh, uh, about this. Now, how did we, how did we get started? Um, what was the... Um, what was the starting point? So that I reached out to all those panel members once we uh, got people on board, thanking them for their willingness to participate in the discussion and, um, and telling them who else they were joining in with. And I indicated that my role, which it was all along, was to organize and facilitate the discussion. I have more expertise on this now by far than I did then, but at the time I had really relatively little and I didn't view that as being what I brought to the table particularly anyway. So I said our objective is to shed light on an aspect of our field that is too often misunderstood and misused in the broader research community and in the process provide the community a service. Our intended audience is researchers, practitioners, and science writers who are not primarily statisticians, but we acknowledge that the worldwide community of statisticians will be attentive to such a statement. So then I posed a, a hypothetical Imagine a best-case scenario where that the crafted ASA statement on p-values could over time positively change the course of science by eliminating ambiguous and circular thinking, possibly even leading to alternative measures that are more natural for the human mind to understand and use. What would such a statement need to conclude? And then, I, to be clear, I asked people to uh, briefly describe up to three points, um, which, of course, no one felt obliged to to limit to three points. Um, the, uh, any more than any of you would, we're all there together. Um, please also remember that I'm not presuming, and I'm still not, that an ASA statement will change the course of science, but I was only posing a hypothetical to evoke strong responses. Turns out that I needed to put no effort into evoking strong responses. <laughs> now, I got good responsiveness from that and discovered that the, their responses clustered very nicely into um, five categories or five things that would need to be in a statement. So a clear basic statement about what the p-value is and is not, which turns out to be a little harder um, than, than you might think, including examples of proper and improper use, which we, we didn't end up doing. Um, additional clarification regarding understanding, misunderstanding of the p-value. Alternatives to the p-value. Science and the p-value, that is, where does this come in with respect to multiplicity, replicability, um, explanatory versus confirmatory research, and so on. And then finally, statistical education and the p-value. Whatever changes come about, how do, we, how do we make those changes in terms of the way that we, that we teach our discipline? The next thing we did, next thing I tried to do to keep this moving along was to organize uh, writing teams put together three writing teams or proposed to put together three writing teams that one would work on the, those first two sections, a second on that third section, and the third team on, this, on section D with a delay in, uh, on section E because we felt like we couldn't really talk about that until we had good progress on those previous sections. And then I asked uh, people to um, decide which one they wanted to join I hope to uh, encourage people just to be in one of those three because they uh, they were hard and I knew it would take a lot of work, but but people some people wanted to be in more than one group, and so that was fine. So we, we had writing teams to start thinking about this, and so three teams were formed, and then this happened. Okay, so my friend and colleague uh, David Trefimo's editorial came out in 
in, um, in that journal that he mentions he edits, Basic and Applied Social Psychology, indicating that the, um, editor- that the, that the uh, journal, after a, a grace period of, of uh, already having a discussion about this, had decided that from now on it was banning null hypothesis uh, significance testing uh, in articles in that journal and asking authors uh, to do some other things instead. And contrary to popular belief, that inference ban was not the reason for the ASA statement, that the order was, was wrong there. We had already started when that ban came along, but it sure did put a kick into the process um, because it had taken me nearly a full year, um, well, maybe closer to nine months. Uh, well, it was a full year from the time the board uh, approved this to get really to the point that I just described with those with those three writing teams. But over the next few months, with that kickstart, we had really excellent discussions. And the thing that I need to say here in full disclosure is that um, up to that point, my brilliant battle plan uh, for getting this statement written was moving along uh, the the way that I had it laid out. But that's as far as that got. Um, And those writing teams never quite worked the way that we envisioned them, but they worked. Uh, ultimately, in the sense that we did get a lot done. Um, Now, there were a lot of discussions, and as I was uh, preparing to speak to you today, I I went back through, you know, tons of email that went back and forth between people, and I found one discussion that particularly uh, uh, amused me and still, still rings to be interesting. This person said, in the beginning, science relied on observational, often anecdotal evidence, but moved forward with statistical uh, analysis to beat, to beat mere anecdotes, and moved forward again that statistical analysis should be encouraged, then started backwards by equating too much of statistical analysis with the p-value itself, took another step backwards in that the p-value became sort of a, a mindless thing that you, you just responded to, and then one further step backwards, that mindlessness in science was blamed on the p-value, which led to banning p-values being equated with banning mindlessness in science, which is not what David was saying, but you can see the, uh, the step that's going on there. All right, we got as far as we could, and then it was time to uh, uh, meet in person. We had lots of phone discussions and email discussions, but it's time to, to sit down together and thrash this out, and so... We brought uh, all the available members of the committee, uh, about 20 were able to come, and met for two days at our headquarters in Alexandria, Virginia, in October of 2015. So, you know, a year and a half already has has gone in this process. Debate was vigorous, to say the least, but an outline emerged from the meeting. And then uh, a draft uh, statement uh, emerged from that, put together by a, a small team of the participants. And then it only took a mere four more months to get to a final draft from that point. And and that ASA statement on p-values that I uh, showed you a bit of was posted online uh, four months later, just about two years after the time that we started on that process. But those four months were important four months. They included time for the the, uh, participants, including the ones who weren't able to be at the ASA uh, headquarters for that meeting to g- have their say. And then, of course, if, if we're asking the board of directors to endorse something, we want to give them the chance to have a good chance to, to look at it and think about it. Along the way, we gave every member of the P-Values panel the opportunity to write a comp- uh, comment paper to supplement the ASA statement, and many of them took us up on it. So When you go online to see the ASA statement and you read it and then you get down to the bottom, there's a mere 23 more papers that you can read. And that just illustrates uh, uh, a lot about how difficult this process was. And in fact, during those four months, I was not a bit sure that there would be an ASA statement on p-values. It wasn't obvious that we would coalesce on a draft that was acceptable to everyone. And it certainly wasn't a given that the board would uh, endorse it just because we had a draft. But I think that what kept this from crashing on the rocks during that time is that there was enough word that had gotten out about this process that we were engaged in that 
people expected something to happen. And everybody uh, that was involved knew that and didn't want to end up with, you know, the press release that says after two years, we did nothing. Um, I, I, I personally wasn't keen on figuring out how to write that press release. All right. What's been the uh, impact? Have we just been uh, windmill tilting on this? Well, um, here's some here's some measurables, I guess. Uh, uh, as of like yesterday, there have been over 380,000 uh, downloads of, of the statement. Um, and according to Google Scholar, it's been cited over 2,600 times. Now, statisticians look at numbers like that and they say, well, look, Maybe that's good, but you got to have something to compare that with to get some, some sense of how good a number that is. So, so maybe I'll just compare it with, say, another paper that I wrote. Okay? All right? So it's gotten a little more traction than, that, uh, than this particular Wasserstein paper. It's not 380,000 views is pretty good, but it's not quite as good as 2.6 billion views of Taylor Swift's Shake It Off video. So that, that helps keep a person humble. Um, it's not nearly as many views as the 15 million views that John Oliver's um, la la uh, Last Week Tonight on scientific reproducibility has gotten in the several years that it's been out. But I want to highlight that because um, that is a really worthwhile thing to go on YouTube and watch. It's loaded with the F-bomb. But it's also loaded with spot-on uh, analysis of, of the issues that, that you're here to talk about today. So it's the most downloaded uh, article, the highest altmetric score in all of Taylor and Francis's journals. So that's encouraging. But it has some shortcomings. Um, and the biggest one is that we heard from a lot of people that said, oh, thank you very much for telling us what not to do. But we got to do something. We can't just not do things. And so and the ASA statement really doesn't have a whole lot of advice in that regard. So we then worked on putting together a, a, a panel. Well, that's not quite right. A conference we called the Symposium on Statistical Inference, which was held in October of 2017. So now, you know, well into the third year on, on this effort. Um, and, uh, and, and some people here were participants in that. There was an open call for participation, and we had lofty goals for this. Uh, uh, from the call for papers, we said we wanted to drive change on the matters raised in the ASA statement, providing necessary impetus for lasting improvements in science and society, in the teaching of statistics, statistical practice, and the dissemination in many uses of statistical results. So that's pretty lofty, and so, you know, we thought while we were at it that we might as well try to solve the problems of the Korean Peninsula, perhaps address all issues related to climate change and get Brexit all worked out. So we, we, we tried to roll as many things into this, uh, into this conference as, as we possibly could. So the, the product, uh, the outcome of this uh, effort, the symposium, was uh, to be uh, a special issue of the American Statistician, an open access, online only issue, that where we would take papers from the conference, but also from anyone else that wanted to submit a paper, we would we would review it and decide whether or not to include the paper. So, to give you a sense of this, the the scale of this process, the timeline of it, we started in February of 2014. In fall of 2015, that panel met. We finally got a statement in March of 2016. We held that symposium in 2017, and then all the way to March of, of last year, just about a year ago, this special issue of the American Statistician uh, was published. And that wouldn't have happened. Uh, I, I edited that issue along with uh, Alan Sherm and Nicole Lazar, but we wouldn't have gotten there without all these um, various associate editors, who uh, some of whom were uh, on the p-value, and those were a p-value statement, those were hired. And of course, you can never, ever, ever do a peer-reviewed journal without having lots of anonymous viewers uh, who, who, helped, who helped us out along the way. We had to redact their names because, of course, they're anonymous reviewers. All right. So what was this spe uh, special issue on inference? It had 43 papers uh, plus an editorial, so it was a massive undertaking because it was the equivalent of, of three 
regular issues of the American Statistician, which we publish four times a year, the editorial and several of the most influential papers in the special issue argue for discontinuing the use of statistical significance as a metric for scientific worth, which is the issue that David was raising just a few minutes ago. And then again, to take a quick look at, at metrics here, uh, in less than a year, it's been downloaded uh, over um, 152,000 times. It's already picking up citations, um, 339 as of, as of yesterday. Um, it was the, uh, the top open access item. In other words, it was the, the most downloaded paper in 2019 uh, by, in all of Taylor and Francis's um, journals. In the special issue, oh, just to add just a few more metrics real quick. So across all 43 articles, not including the editorial, there are over 270,000 downloads as of yesterday. That's about a mean of 6,300 per article, or median is probably better to look at, about 5,300 downloads per article, which makes most of those articles more downloaded than any, any typical statistics paper. Um, Total citations across the 43 articles, not including the editorial, as of yesterday, 659, uh, median of about nine uh, per article. That's not too bad. And so including the editorial, that means that in less than a year, um, things in that special issue have been cited nearly a thousand times. But I need to be clear that the special issue is done what I call the old-fashioned way, the, the, the science way, I would say, and that is that the the 2016 statement is a consensus document from a panel of experts that was subsequently, as I pointed out, reviewed and endorsed by the ASA Board of Directors. That's not how we usually do science. Um, we usually duke it out in the journals, um, and, and I'm, I'm big on that. Um, but for reasons that I elaborated on briefly earlier, we decided that it had been duked out in the journals for decades and nothing was going anywhere on that time to do something different. But that's not what, what went on here. This is not a, 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 a statement from a panel. It's a collection of peer-reviewed journal articles. It was supported by the ASA in the sense that ASA resources were used to produce it, including, of course, my time, although most of the time I spent on it was evenings and weekends. That's hardly the point. But it is not, and this is the point, it's not a statement of the ASA. And there's been some, some confusion on that point. Um, some people have thought the editorial was a statement from the ASA, um, possibly because I'm one of the authors uh, created that impression. But we did say that the ideas in this editorial are likewise open to debate. They are our own attempt to distill the wisdom of the many voices in this issue into an essence of good statistical practice as we currently see it. And just to make it clear that this is a highly debatable point, and that is that my boss disagreed with me on this. The ASA pres 2019 ASA President Karen Kafadar said, I do not think that all the recent attention to p-values will persuade people to listen to statisticians. It may have the opposite effect. People may decide they don't need statistical methods at all. Still, the ASA is heavily invested in this effort. The, um, the ASA statement charted new territory for the association. As I already said, it was something that we aren't accustomed to do. The special issue of the American statistician and all that led up to it, the symposium and other things, helped to respond with some positive ideas about what to do instead of just what not to do. And... Um, as Deborah Mayo mentioned in the discussion uh, a, a moment ago in the previous session, that uh, back in November, President Karen Kafadar, along with the board, formed a task force on statistical significance and reproducibility. Uh, the idea is to now then take a look and see what it is that the ASA might be ready to endorse. Um, it might could it could be the, uh, the the work that we did in that uh, editorial, and it may very well not be so. So we're kind of swinging back around to maybe something like uh, the ASA statement um, when it comes to what uh, the 2016 ASA statement. Maybe there'll be a 2020 ASA statement of some kind. Too early in the process to tell. And they have, I hope they go faster than I did, or there it'll be more like a 2021 or 2022 ASA statement. 
So what did we say in, in, that, um, in that editorial that I said that there was disagreement about? Uh, here's one example. We conclude, based on our review of the articles in this special issue and the broader literature, that it is time to stop using the term statistically significant entirely, nor should variants such as significantly different, P less than 0.05, and non-significant survive, whether expressed in words, by asterisks in a table, or some other way. So what's that look like so far? Um, well, there's been a lot of discussion about it. Um, and I, I do have to say that there's been a lot of the, what I consider the best kind of discussion. Um, uh, Deborah and I do not see eye to eye on this, but we have great discussions about it. She has kept me informed of, of her thinking and, um, and her, her, her blog is fascinating. And so I feel like there's really good discussion going on, not only within the statistical community, but outside it as well, where that needs to happen, there has been calls for change to journal practices. And one thing that I want to make real clear at this point is that nowhere in anything that we wrote for this or anything else that I have written have I or the ASA ever suggested that we stop using p-values. That's not the point. P-values remain a valuable tool, and what we are after is not binding p-values in terms of the way practice takes place to a threshold, especially to an arbitrary threshold. And so, um, as someone mentioned in the previous session, there are indeed um, five major medical journals in the world, and we've been in correspondence with four of the five and working on the fifth. And some of those correspondences have led to, uh, or at least contributed to, part of that change. And the change that the New England Journal has recommended in terms of the advice it gives to authors is not everything that I hoped it would be, but it's a lot better than what was going on in terms of asking people to be more thoughtful about what they do with their, with their statistical analysis, with their p-values, with their effect sizes, and so on. JAMA has taken more of a, a wait-and-see attitude. Um, let's see if the statistical community comes up with something better than statistical significance before we, um, before we move on. So there have indeed been actual changes to journal practices um, and, and many less well-known uh, journals. Uh, that's not fair to say. Many journals that are well-known in their disciplines, but not as broadly known as the medical journals, have also made changes to author practices. So I, I want to um, uh, wind up here by just connecting this to reproducibility or, or replicability, depending on you know, how you use the terms. I, I noted the um, National Academy's uh, definition here, which means that for most of the time we'd be talking about rep replicability in their, in their terminology, but I, I don't think that's important. But, but I would just say this much uh, about this. Um, if bright lines are bad for science, if that's a, a premise that you accept, and it might not be, then they don't make sense for reproducibility studies either. That is to say, it's not reasonable or realistic to conclude simply that something is reproducible or not, as opposed to something that could be on a, on a continuum, where, in, in my judgment, that, that some of the really interesting stuff that could be going on is um, in that space where the studies disagree. Why do they disagree? And what do we learn from the nature of those disagreements? So that's what we've done. And I encourage other professional uh, organizations to take principal stands on rel uh, relevant matters when appropriate. But that's going to look different for you than it did for us because all organizations have their own uh, cultures and, and, and are more or less ready to to do something like this. We were finally ready to do something like this at the ASA in 2014, but, but five years earlier, we wouldn't have been. It's hard work. It, uh, it, it, was, uh, it was frustrating uh, sometimes uh, how difficult it was just to keep the discussion moving, to, um, to keep people from not splintering off before they had a, a, the full opportunity to hear from the rest of their colleagues and, 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 and see what we could agree on which ultimately was what the ASA statement was. It was, it, that, was as, that was as much agreement as we were going to get. There wasn't going to be a seventh principle. 
um, because there was that was it at the time. And, but it was intensely rewarding. At the end of the day, um, I do think that it's making a difference. It's um, uh, between the ASA statement and the subsequent work, there's a lot of discussion. And I think that discussion is good. And, and ultimately, I trust that it will take us to a better place than we would have been if we just kept leaving things like they were. And so thank you for this extraordinary opportunity to share this with you. And look at that. We're close to being back on time. So I don't know, um, David, how many questions you want me to take now or whatever. Okay, whatever. I'll do my best. Yes, sir. Oh, okay. Uh, what about the Russian Statistical Association and the English uh, or the Japanese? I mean, are there other statistical associations that are running into similar kinds of things and are thinking about this? So I don't know. Um, uh, there is no Japanese Statistical Association. It, well, it's a very tiny one. Um, it has about it has a handful of people in it because, as it turns out, there are no departments of statistics in Japan at all. Um, but uh, so I don't know um, what other uh, statistical associations are doing. Um, just to be candid, we have resources that many of those associations don't have. And so it makes it harder for them to, to take on something like this when they have whole other issues uh, to take on. Really, the, the, the Royal Statistical Society is, uh, is the only other society of comparable size and it's probably half the size of the ASA. The Institute for Mathematical Statistics uh, is also a, a sizable and um, weighty organization as well, but this is not something that I, I'm aware of that they felt any need to weigh into. Yes, please. Yes, sir. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tom Rubin. Uh, I'm rising because you use the term audit. Uh, I'm a CPA and a certified internal audit. Auditor, uh, in my profession, it is amazing the difference in what we believe the term audit means and what the members of the public mean, which we generally find out when we're being sued. <laughs> uh, so my suggestion is that uh, in your publication, if you use the term, you define it in your context, and I might also suggest that you have some examples, some definition by examples of what you mean by audit. Thank okay, you. Okay, I'll go back and look and see how we've handled that, but that's a great point. Thank you. It looks like. <laughs> My question is for Dr. Wasserstein, but also other people in this room. What you're doing with ASA is heroic and it is making science better, but it's a very difficult, big, long-term project to educate people on p-values and, and what it means. I'm wondering how many people, in, including with ASA, would be open to a very small baby step, which is certainly not perfect and doesn't address many of the problems and issues that you thought of, which is simply uh, pointing out how absurdly arbitrary 5% is. I remember w switching over from physical sciences, or I'm used to reading papers every day, to the medical literature and the epidemiological literature. I couldn't believe that people take seriously those papers with P of 0.05. That just amazed me. You mean you're going to uh, seriously consider an effect which has a 5% chance of being due to uh, random noise? This is crazy. I mean, nobody in our field would take anything seriously unless it's 1% then you want to start thinking about it. So that, of course, won't solve all the things. It's, it, it's, but uh, would that be something that, that's, it's a very simple little baby step forward. Do you think anybody uh, would even consider uh, attacking the 5%? Well, right, so, that so thanks for that. Um, and obviously be happy to hear what other people have to say. Um, one, of the, one of the frustrating things about the New England Journal's um, changes to the author instructions is that they say with a perfectly straight face that um, our, that authors shouldn't just use um, p less than 0.05 arbitrarily or pick a threshold, but they should give the um, 
the uh, a, a theoretical or empirical justification for the threshold that they pick. Um, I don't know how many people have ever seen a theoretical or empirical justification recently for P less than 0.05. I mean, nobody, nobody justifies that. They, they simply, um, they simply do it right. So, so that's the first point I like to make. It, second thing I'd like to say is that in a in a talk I very frequently give a, uh, in more detail about p values and statistical significance, I, I show the things that happen uh, in the literature because people feel like they have to explain why their p-value didn't make it to 0.05 and, and, and just how arbitrary that ends up being. And then the last comment I'd make real quickly before you know, asking what anybody else wants to say about p-values is, is that one of the recommendations that's been made uh, is to um, go from p less than 0.05 to p less than 0.005 as the... Um, uh, as as a threshold, and um, I have a problem with that if it is the um, if it becomes uh, just another de facto threshold instead of saying this this would work in this discipline for these reasons and it wouldn't work um, uh, uh, in others uh, as al already uh, pointed out in um, in genomics it, the threshold is much lower than that. And the, the illustration I like to give for um, not just arbitrarily moving from one threshold to another, like P less than 0.05 to P less than 0.005, is this. Um, I don't know how many baseball fans there are in, are in here, but, but I'm a, a big baseball fan and a, um, and a longtime lover of the Kansas City Royals, which I do have to tell you is not an easy passion to hold on to, but... Um, uh, but I hold it very dearly anyway. And in 1985, um, the Royals won a, a, a World Series in part because an umpire made a mistake and called a Royals player safe at first base when, in the ninth inning of Game 6 when that player was out. They didn't, have, they didn't do the instant replay thing back then. Now, long before I ever started thinking about p-values and statistical significance, I pondered how to solve those close plays at first base. Those plays, by the way, are called bang-bang plays because they're, they're so close and they, they require something physically impossible of umpires, which is to see the ball go into the glove while at the same time watching the foot touch the bag. Can't be done, so they have to listen for it instead. They have to listen for the sound of the ball hitting the glove and the foot hitting the base and, and, and make a call. So I have a, a simple, elegant solution to those close plays at first base. Move the bag three feet farther down the line. <laughs> now, if the bag was three feet farther down the line, George Orta would have clearly been out, and that probably would have been it for the Kansas City Royals in the 1985 World Series. But obviously, all that's going to happen is that we'll have close plays three feet farther down the line. And that's my fear of just saying, oh, well, you know, even though 0.005 has much more mathematical justification behind it than 0.05 does, people can p-hack their way to 0.005 the same way they can do it for 0.05. It just, you know, but the ingenuity is a quality that, w that runs in our, in our human race quite, quite well. So, all right, so there were, but did somebody else want to comment on his suggestion? Yeah, Tony does. I, I, I just wanted to point out that there's a, a long tradition in statistical decision theory uh, going back to the 50s that, that says there is no right answer to what is a good number. It depends on the costs of type 1 and type 2 error. And the thing to do is to look at your loss function in, in, in any case. What's useful about the concept of a p-value is how big is that tail area and everything else is what are the relative costs of the two types of errors? And now let's minimize the uh, maximizing expected utility, minimize expected loss. So I, I, I didn't want us to forget that, yeah. that fundamental point. Right. So thank you for that. Yeah. And when you do your consultations, your collaborations, um, do you find it hard to pull from your collaborators 
meaningful information to help decide on risk and loss, or even things like what a, a, a meaningful uh, effect size would be? Because that's what we, a lot of people seem to run into. Ah, there you go. Okay. Any other comments on this thread? Okay, then I'll take a, another question. Let me go in the back and then up, up here next, okay? Thank you for coming and speaking to us. Uh, I'm, my name is Robbie Spofford, and I am a senior in the economics program at Utah State. Um, I'm very curious to know, as a senior student who's actually also a TA for econometrics, and I've been teaching statistics to fellow students in addition to having to take statistics classes right along with a lot of people these days. Obviously, I don't think my statistician uh, professors would be very happy with me citing uh, these types of articles in Stat 101 classes when we're trying to talk about uh, p, you know, p value of 0 0.05 or what is the statistical significance level convention these days. Um, so what I'm curious to know is, you know, as as a student, you know, or even as a you know young researcher trying to go into this, what is the best way to um, kind of work and you know dialogue with other students and other professors uh, while still you know not going seeming like the crazy person in the room who's like not doing what the textbook says to do. So. Yeah, so it's really difficult when, especially when you're an undergraduate, to um, to, to stick your neck out. Um, doesn't hurt to go ahead and and um, and including your reference list, some references to some of these things. But what you've touched on, Robbie, is a bigger problem, and that is that um, change is hard. And so even, you know, those who accept that changes that we're recommending, and clearly not everyone does, um, recognize that it's very difficult to make that happen um, because, for one thing, there are a whole lot of people that have to be taught that um, uh, because w everybody's been trained to sort of focus on P less than 0.05 and kind of a, um, a rote method for doing hypothesis testing that nobody really thinks is, is the ideal way to, to do science, regardless of whether you, you agree that we should get rid of these cutoffs or not. So that sort of change is going to is going to take a while, um, and we talk a little bit about that in, in that editorial I referenced. In one of the articles in there, um, in, this, in the uh, 43 articles in the special issue, um, Steve Goodman makes uh, an interesting point about why it's so hard to make, the, make these changes. He, he equates the idea of p-values as being the currency in science, the way money functions, as a currency. And so f for the large extent, money works because we, we believe something about its value. And so, so I accept $5 from you in exchange from s something I'm, I'm giving you. And, and that system works because of the faith that we have in it. And similarly, p-values have sort of become the, the, the currency by which you get your grant funded or your paper published or whatever, and, you know, it, it's very hard to make those changes. So my, others may have better advice for you on this, but I would say that it's, it's okay to have that discussion with your, in your paper that you're turning in, even if you still have to satisfy the professor by saying, you oh, know, by the way, P was less than 0.05. But when you do that, don't just say P less than 0.05, report your P value, your actual P value, talk about your effect sizes, mention your confidence intervals, think about what, um, what the endpoints of those confidence intervals mean, and not just talk about whether zero was in the confidence interval or not, because then you've just done the same thing a different way. Okay, yes, sir, I, I promised that we would get to you next. Yep. Hello, uh, this is Jim Enstrom. Jim? Uh, I want to really thank you for your willingness to come to this politically incorrect conference. <laughs> that show, shows a lot of class on your part. Um, my question regards um, if you can give any inside information on how the chief uh, EPA statistician, Barry Nosbaum, became the ASA president in 2017 and then came out with a strong statement opposing the Honest Act, which is now the EPA transparency rule. 
Yeah, so I don't know the chain of events that uh, that that led to that, and I'm not as familiar with the Honest Act as I should be. Um, so I would just say this: ask Barry. Barry is quite willing to um, answer questions. I have his email address, and I'd be happy to get it to you. I don't have it in my head, but I'd be. I, I my email address is there. Okay. Well, I would be happy to help try to connect you rather than try to try to speak for Barry. Okay. And Deborah, you had a question. Wait, hang on one second. Get the microphone, right? Yeah. Um, of course, data dredging, cherry picking, selection effects affect all of statistical measures, not just the p-value. And a problem that a lot of people have is that somehow these other measures, um, yeah, aren't aren't critically analyzed, the fact that the actual p-value and the error probability um, cannot be controlled once you violate the requirements that uh, you pre-specify uh, is actually a good thing about the p-values. I'm wondering, though, what you think about, let's say, the same p-hat hypothesis can occur in a Bayes factor, or likelihood ratio of Bayes plus theory, and yet somehow these other uh, approaches aren't looked at. Do you think it's time that they, the AS says, would it be valuable for some kind of subgroup to look at these methods have been used for a long time now and they could also um, use guidelines? So that's a great point. They could also use guidelines. And one of the things that we indicated in the conclusion to the ASA statement and in other things that we have written is that um, – we have basically lost if we just move from one arbitrary threshold to a different one. So, all right, Wasserstein says not to use P less than 0.05, so I'm going to use uh, 6.87 as my threshold for Bayes factor, and if it's bigger than that, then, then I believe this, and it's, if it's smaller than that, I believe that, and we get nowhere if we're just as arbitrary about thresholds in other um, other metrics. Why didn't we attack that um, in the in the in the statement itself, other than just a brief reference to it in the conclusion? Because what we were seeing in in the overwhelming amount of the literature was the the misunderstanding and misuses of p values and statistical significance. But you can cheat on on likelihood ratios or other things as well, and and so, yeah, I, I, I think that would be worthwhile. Not easy, um, and I'm, I'm not sure what kind of medication I'm going to need before I try to get into that again. <laughs> but, but, yeah. Uh, Stan? I think one of the elephants in the room is not using a statistical technique with an honest intention one of the elephants in the room is people have skillfully learned how to exploit current practice. And so they are intentionally dishonest about how they do their work. So I find it surprising to have all these discussions about this and that and sort of presuming that the scientist is doing an honest job. And if we just taught them better, and if they were just less ignorant, that the problems would go away. I don't see any police, and I don't see, and I see massive amounts of gaming the system, and I haven't seen anything from the ASA that talks about the gaming, the police, the whatever. So all I can say about that is that if, um, and this doesn't address things that you have um, uh, written and worked valiantly for with regards to um, multiplicity and so on. But in just the most straightforward instance, when, um, when there's not an arbitrary threshold to get at, when, there's, when, when the world is such that there's no real meaningful difference in what, what happens next, if you get P equal 0.049 versus P equal 0.051, then, then you... Um, then people can't hack their way, won't, won't, 
won't need to hack their way into those kinds of things. Now, I know you're talking about uh, bigger issues than that, but that's where, that's the, the lane that I've been operating in. Yeah, Nathan. I think you, you may have described the p-value statement as the first uh, rodeo for the ASA in, in the world of position papers. But the ASA has had um, position papers on ethical guidelines, right? Yes. And if I'm correct, at least some – and it's gone through several iterations. Is that right? So we have ethical guidelines that are uh, reviewed periodically, yep. And if I remember correctly, one of the iterations of these guidelines was very specific in saying we're not just talking about statisticians. We, we think these guidelines apply to anybody who uses statistical procedures. Uh, that, that's one, and I, I have to admit to being vague, but, but they've changed over time. And I, I believe that in one iteration, um, the use of uh, – Un undisclosed multiplicity was condemned as an ethical violation, and that may have been walked back or disappeared in, in later. Do, do, do you, are you familiar with the ethical guidelines? I am, but, I, but they're quite lengthy, and I don't remember that particular thing. What I do recall is that they definitely apply to, um, they're aimed at good statistical practice by statisticians, but there clearly are sections in there which require things of the, of the non-statisticians as well. I'd be happy to see what kind of uh, history I can find out from you, for you on that because I know exactly who to ask. I would just ask that you remind me by email because by the time I get home on the red eye tonight, I will have forgotten this conversation completely. <laughs> well, well, thank you for your presentation. Yeah. Thank you for doing that. And Thanks. And I'm gonna say it has actually been wonderfully more than 15 minutes with you a day. So I'm going to ask for a big round of applause. Thanks. I want to especially thank all of our speakers and panelists for their wonderful presentations and superb work in addressing the various serious issues pertaining to fixing science. So can I have a round of applause again for everyone? And we're particularly grateful to all of you for joining with us and making the discussion so insightful and productive. There is obviously much to do, um, as our speaker just suggested. Um, but I believe we now have a real sense of what should and perhaps can be done. In closing, may I share a quote from the Nobel laureate physicist Richard Feynman. Quote, science is the belief in the ignorance of experts. When someone says science teaches such and such, he is usually using the word incorrectly. Science doesn't teach it, experience teaches it. Feynman describes judgment in science as a skill to quote, pass on the accumulated wisdom plus the wisdom that it might not be wisdom, to teach both the, the, to accept and reject the past with a kind of balance that takes considerable skill. Science alone of all the subjects contains within itself the lesson of the danger of belief in the infallibility of the greatest teachers of the preceding generation, unquote. And with the marvelous experience of this conference, Let's indeed roll up our sleeves and get to work to rescuing and fixing science. In this regard, uh, I'd like to ask you to consider sharing insights and info from the conference in articles, blogs, and elsewhere, personally, professionally, and publicly, uh, in the hope that we can engage others in many of these issues. Please also visit our website, independent.org. Uh, for information on upcoming Independent Institute events, hopefully additional ones with NAS in the future. 
We look forward to seeing you again, and thank you very much. Peter? Well, just a few final words to this exceptionally patient audience. Um, when we arrived on Thursday before this event, uh, we're staying at the local hotel, and around the corner I saw that we were next to Citizen Canine offering Spain and neutering. And I said, that's not the kind of fixing we came here to do. <laughs> but Speak for some of you may have feel, feel that uh, there was a little bit of that going on anyway. But you've been exceptionally polite to each other. You've modeled civility and discourse in the sciences. You are not at all what our attackers said before this event. Uh, I am taking great pleasure in how well this event has unrolled over a day and a half of uh, constant um, discourse on a lot of complicated topics, most of which were over my head. Um, I want to start by thanking my colleague, David Randall. A number of you have come up to me to express your pleasure in my organizing this wonderful conference. I did nothing. Um, I have a staff member who wanted to organize this conference, and I let him run with it. Uh, he invited people from all over the place, men and women, Californians, Arcan Arkansans, everyone. Um, it took him about six months of going back and forth to hone a list of speakers that made sense speaking to each other, even though they were saying diverse things and saying them extremely well. So David, thank you very much. And of course, I want to talk or express my thanks to David Thoreau and to Graham Walker and to Alicia Luther as well, to all of the staff at the Independent Institute. They hosted this event. They made the space available to us. They helped us publicize it. And they brought you into this room. Um, I am so grateful to Independent Institute, and I do hope we will be able to hold additional collaborations in the future. Um, while expressing thanks, I must, of course, give my thanks to Lenny Teitelman for having uh, given us such astonishing publicity. So thanks, Lenny. Um, I should mention, if you haven't already uh, seen it, that we are under further attack from a uh, man named John Mashey, who yesterday published Dark Moneyed Denialists Are Running Fixing Science Symposium of Doubt. This is the Symposium of Doubt. Um, I, that's on the smog blog if you care to look it up. Uh, some of you are mentioned by name for your evil tendencies. Um, uh, the, um, uh, Mr. Mashey is not reproducible in an for several reasons, but uh, among them his uh, claims about who we are, who Independent Institute is, who you are, are just nonsensical. But you should know that it's out there, and um, that might be a factor to take into account if you uh, take up David's invitation to write about this. Many of you do write blogs, op-ed pieces, and things like that. Uh, we think we've started, or at least accelerated, an important discussion that's already taking place in the United States and abroad. Um, we'd like to keep that going with your help. Um, and to that end, uh, if you would allow us to publish the um, uh, written versions of your talks, I'd enjoy doing that as well. Um, uh, I'm counseled by one of our speakers that I should always be asking for something, so I will. Uh, the National Association of Scholars is a membership group. A good many of you are members, but those of you who aren't, uh, we invite you to join. We are a very uh, uh, efficiently run organization that takes only modest uh, annual membership dues. We also have a California affili affiliate. Um, uh, Matt Malkin over here is the president of it, an astronomer at UCLA. And the California affiliate hosts its own events. We participate with them. There's a lot going on in California. This is the second time within four weeks that we've been out here holding big conferences, and it's likely we will be back for more. Um, 
So I think that's probably what I have to say there. Uh, I don't really have a ritual incantation of, uh, uh, as an anthropologist, of course I should, uh, that, <laughs> that, that will send you safely on your ways. But um, I'll express again my, my pleasure in our ability to take sharply differing views on a variety of subjects. This was not an occasion dominated by any kind of ideology. There were opinions expressed. They clashed, but they clashed in a good way. So my gratitude to you, both as speakers and as members of this audience, thank you so much for coming. <laughs>